the road towards Vision 2030 as it relates to our current and future circumstances in Zimbabwe might enhance responsible and responsive leadership, encourage more youth to become active citizens in pursuit of Zimbabwe's progress, and attract more partners and investors as government reaches out to the world economy through platforms like the World Economic Forum. In addition, it is our hope as young people the depth and reach of our engagement today is a reflection of our love for Zimbabwe's progress, our resolve to do more even with less, and our commitment to responsible active citizenship. In the words of John Lewis, I therefore dare ask, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And if not here, then where? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and God bless you. How was your trip from Brussels? It was fulfilling, you know, thank you very much for asking me. Uh, I arrived here at 8 minutes past 12, uh, so I'm, I'm still jet lagged, but I, I couldn't miss this uh, anything, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is the first time that Zimbabwe was invited to come in the press and the age with uh, the EU members of parliament in, in Brussels, and, and I felt that at the end of that engagement, uh, in terms of to making sure they understand our economic reform agenda. But that came across very well, it was well appreciated, and, and everyone of them is saying that's very good, but let's walk the talk to make sure that all the steps that you say will follow, will follow them, uh, and follow the targets. And I'm also hopeful that we will certainly uh, uh, do it in the next few years, uh, but making sure that we build towards that vision 2030. Okay, excellent. It's good to have you today. I think I'll just start off by saying you're the Minister of Finance of Zimbabwe. Did you ever think as a young person, like we are now in your 20s, that you'd ever be the finance minister? When you were 28, you, were, you had a good job. You were working for the London School of Economics, a better job than most of us have, and certainly a job to begin with, which is what a lot of us can't even speak to. So tell me, what is your feeling around that? Well, it's also an honor to serve as the Minister of Finance and Economic Development for your country. Uh, it's just a real honor. So when I was asked, uh, I didn't have to be asked twice, but only once and I accepted uh, and, and that was it. And I know that uh, for my family it was rather sudden, if not traumatic, because they were aware I was busy doing things in, in Switzerland in the corporate sector, uh, doing pri private equity, advising governments. And little did I know that uh, I would be advising myself <laughs> and so, as uh, Minister of Finance without mentioning, I think I can mention that I was uh, doing quite a bit of work actually advising the government of Ghana on economic management. Uh, and and he, here, here I am now. So it was all quite sudden, but all, all, all worthwhile, and I'm delighted that I, I agreed. Uh, it is a challenge, uh, but for me, that's my nature. If you know me at all, I love complexity. Yeah, so I know it's a complex job. If it's not complex, I'm not interested. It's too simple. It has to occupy me all the time. Uh, if those who work with me, they'll tell you that I'm the one who's always running ahead of them. Like, I'm energetic, I'm passionate about whatever I, I do. I, I, I love everything that I always decide to do. Thoroughly, thoroughly. That's good to hear. Um, I know, okay, we know that you've attended the World Economic Forum before in different capacities. Um, but this is your first time that you're attending, or this is the first time that you are attending as the Minister of Finance and Economic Development within that role. So I think to build off that, what key opportunities do you intend to leverage on? And can you in simple terms, terms as well explain the strategic importance of attending a meeting like this at Davos to someone who's on the street? Um, you know, to, for them to understand the importance of Davos and the whole scheme of things. How important is Davis to the man on the street, to the student in school, to someone who's looking for a job, how important is Davis to us? Zimbabwe has to take its place once again in the international uh, you know, global community.
community on, on the economic front, on the political front. So the Davos opportunity is one such opportunity for doing exactly that, for us to present ourselves, showcase ourselves as a country. Uh, this is re-engagement after all, uh, that, that we've lost for several decades. And it, it's, it's our opportunity. And, and I'm thrilled with the, with the theme uh, for WEF this year, which is Globalization 4.0, uh, uh, which really tries to highlight that the world is shifting from multilateralism to plurilateralism. And then also shifting from a, a, a multipolar, or rather unipolar world in terms of distribution of global power to a, to a multipolar world. You can look east, you can look west, you can look north. There are enough partners to, to, to talk to. But I always say that for Zimbabwe, we must look everywhere. We shouldn't look east, west, north, south, look everywhere. But then you, see, you must still know where, where to look. What I particularly like about the, the WEF theme, theme as well, uh, Newton, is, is this focus on the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, which is really a tech focus, and this is where the youth come in. They're always more tech savvy than anyone else. I think this is a really nice place for us to, to plug in what we can do, what we can learn in terms of in order to support our youth. Uh, so if you look at, for instance, at the pillars of Vision 2030, you'll try to find that the, the, the pillars really also speak to the, the whole theme of, of where if we can really plug our Vision 2030 into that, in the sense that we need to re-engage uh, uh, we've said that's, uh, that's a key pillar of Vision 2030, uh, worth it providing that platform. But also we need to, to immunize ourselves, to strengthen ourselves in a macroeconomic sense or attractive to, to investors. We can resist shocks, we can absorb shocks. Uh, that macroeconomic stabilization is key. And that's what the transitional stabilization is all about. That's what the budget is all about. That's what, that's what austerity for prosperity is all about. To immunize us, ourselves against future shocks and be ready to, 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 to move forward. The fourth, uh, third pillar in the Vision 2030 is the whole issue of inclusive growth. One key issue of the whole notion of inclusive growth is job creation. That's the silver bullet. Uh, uh, I know it means a lot of things to a lot of people. It's special. It's like going to town. Uh, I'm going to my professoral model and try to explain what inclusive growth means. But jobs, jobs, jobs. If, if that's the silver uh, lining of, of, of inclusive growth. Uh, but also regional participation. So our whole issue around decentralization, which we are financing through 5% of our budget allocation in 2019, speaks to that spatial inclusion, and not, not, not inclusion of just the individual through uh, uh, job, job creation. Also in the Vision 2030, we're sensitive to, to the environment, to the planet, so to speak, and that's what uh, Professor Schwab has also highlighted as a pillar of the theme for, for this year. El Nino is upon us. We are to reduce our growth focus for 2019 to 3.1% from initial figure of the order of 6% or so because we're worried about the impact of El Nino. That's a planet issue. So we're fully plugged into 2030, uh, sorry, into uh, the World Economic Forum through the 2030 vision, and we expect all the themes within our vision uh, uh, to be linked to, to, to that. And we'll learn a lot. We'll learn a lot. Honorable Minister. Uh, just, just still on the trip to Davos, a lot of young people are of the mind that the trip is ill-timed, given the crises that we're facing currently in the country. Um, you're aware of the pricing issue, you're aware of the fuel crisis. Um, what is the justification, or why is it mission critical for Zimbabwe to be on that stage um, in Davos this year? It is mission critical for Zimbabwe to be on that stage, because we are, cri are cri uh, cri crucially aware that Zimbabwe cannot solve its economic problems alone. It needs uh, partners, it needs uh, global partners, it needs uh, re-engagement. Re One of the reasons why, for instance, why we are running out, out of Forex, you know, that Forex crunch, is because we can't access enough credit lines. We've lost about 80 different credit lines to our entire banking sector. No bank can access a credit line easily at the moment, if at all. The way it can only be done is, if it's done through the central bank, with a guarantee from Treasury, and, and that's not even enough. You find uh, you know, uh, lenders are also asking for a commodity lead facility, which is, oh, we need uh, gold proceeds or platinum, whatever, to further you know, uh, guarantee the payments on, uh, on, on, for, for this loan. So, so it is serious, it's an issue, and we have to be black with the global community. We have to keep banging the door uh, so that we can get those critical uh, credit lines. Certainly, we have to, to bang the door on our creditors, uh, who, who we owe money. Uh, look at World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, 
and, and really the key issue is their shareholders, which is the Paris Club shareholders. And those are the shareholders that we need to talk to continuously uh, so that we can unlock that uh, areas clearance of what back, back in work, and then that will then unlock our access to capital globally, which, which our industry needs to create jobs, uh, to run what, what they do, for us to finance the, our fuel, fuel needs. So the timing is exactly right to send the message that we cannot walk this road alone. We need the international community, we need them to support us, and we're here to sell that message, and that's what we're doing in Davos. After all, also Zimbabwe is open for business. Uh, for those who see the opportunities and want to take those opportunities, we are open for business indeed. That's really good. I think what I want to paint as well for the sake of everyone is that um, not anyone or not any country is invited to Davos. Um, G20 countries are the ones that are in invited to Davos. And the reason why Zimbabwe has gone twice, first once was a miracle, second twice, is because we have a Zimbabwe who's in the World Economic Forum who has lobbied for Zimbabweans, Zimbabwe's involvement within the global framework of the World Economic Forum. So that alone, it's actually quite an honor, and there's a lot that we can definitely leverage um, from the World Economic Forum. So now to bring it, uh, Prof, back home. We have this interesting thing called FCA accounts. So FCA accounts were requested to be opened, and businesses as well on a two-tier tab um, are being also allowed now to pay in US dollar through Zimra. Does this not enforce then that truly our bond is not one to one with the dollar? The fact that FCA accounts have been opened, the fact that Zimra now collects in uh, uh, US dollar, does it not then hit against the notion that our currency is not one is to one? Well, well, the thing is, um, Let's start with the Zimbra issue. That what announced in the budget is very simple. Is that it really uh, the the taxes should be collected in the in the medium of the transaction. That's what it is. You can pay us in bonds. We are comfortable with that. Ever or RTGS or bond. We will accept any of those. Well, what what we were really calling out on was look. If you you charge the, your client in hard US dollars notes, and then you shouldn't be paying Zimbra the VAT thereof in, in, in bond or in, we want some consistency in that because we're feeling that there's some arbitrage taking place. So it was a, a way to close arbitrage behavior within the tax uh, collection. <laughs> On the issue of the currency, it's never an easy one. If there's a, a huge elephant in the room, in my view, left in terms of macro reform, it is currency reform. I'm very comfortable on the fiscal front. I, I, I wouldn't really want to, to, to you know, announce any further taxes. In fact, I think that going forward uh, uh, into 2020, 2021, I should be cutting taxes. So my language is going to change. I can, I can assure you. I, I, I is going to change. Because we cannot have austerity for two or three successive years. One year should be enough. After that, we should listen. Uh, it, should, it should work in the first year, and then we should, we should, we should lose it. So I'm comfortable in the fiscal plans. Monetary front, this is where the, the heavy lifting now has to, has to move uh, 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 towards. So there's a balance, fine balance, between preservation of value and removing pricing distortions. So as you do currency reform, you have to continuously balance those two. If you look at what we did on the 1st of October, uh, if we really think about it carefully, perhaps that was the beginning of currency reform. Do you think that separation of those FCA accounts, uh, and then also building the micro institutions to support a monetary policy, a monetary policy committee, uh, raising the reserve requirement, and so forth. Those are the micro institutions that support uh, monetary policy uh, conduct, and, and separating those FCA accounts is the right thing to do. Uh, the commingling we also felt that was a problem. But we know how the market then reacted, or we reacted, we started putting a premium on what you would consider to be non-US dollar and so forth and so forth. And for us as government, we have to keep balancing that preservation of value and removing a, a, a distortion. We are aware that there are distortions, we are uncomfortable, and we are going to, 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 de to deal with it. Let me say something about US dollarization. I think some of you were very surprised that we've been we've discouraged corporates from, from uh, 
saying that they'll sell their products, US dollars and that's actually yes. my next question, yeah, that discouraged me was actually my next question. Ah, okay. that. Oh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> now, let me tell you what, if, 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 if as a nation we accept the US dollar as our sole currency, then it means that we are afraid of currency reform. That is not currency reform. Accepting the US dollar as the only legal tender is not currency reform. That, that's capitulation. What kind of people are we that we can't even have our own currency? Tell me. You know, I, I, I also hear about, about adopting the, the RAND. I even argued for it a few years ago, and there was a, there was a reason. But, but, but you know what? If you're going to, 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 to argue for the RAND, first of all, to acquire those RANDs, you need US dollars first. So you acquire US dollars, and then you purchase the RAND, and then you quote unquote distribute the runs, what are you trying to do? So it doesn't sound like it's a very uh, a useful path to follow. So my view is long, long term Zimbabwe needs its own currency. Our job as policymakers is to create the right environment for this currency to be credible, to be stable, to be less volatile, and for you to believe in it and bind it. That is our job. So dealing with the fiscal side of things is the first order of business to create the right environment for a stable currency reform going forward. After all, what we have for now is fiscal policy and no monetary policy. So the solution is still fiscal. So, so as long as we tighten the belt in that direction, I can go into detail there, but I bet I shouldn't, you find that uh, 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 the currency volatility is, is well managed. Thank you, Minister. I'm sure a lot of the young people are happy to know that your goal is not to continue to tax an overtaxed youth population. And while we're on that tax, I, I know that you raised about 500 million in the two, using the 2% tax in the month of December. Am I correct? I, I'll, I'll correct that. No, not as much as that, but, okay. but a, a, handsome <laughs> amount, a handsome amount nonetheless. <laughs> Okay, maybe can we talk about this handsome amount because um, I think they, it was said in the in the tabloids that this money was then used for the hiring of 3,000 teachers, 350 university staff, as well as devolution. In your view, do you think this is the most, um, the best way to have used the, the taxation funds and do you not feel that there are more pressing issues that would require those same funds at this time? Oh, thank you very much for that question. First of all, let me be clear. The 2% tax is a wonderful tax. First of all, it ensures maximum coverage. It ensures compliance. It ensures that we can also make sure that the informal sector contributes to the fiscus. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Treasury is owed, or maybe I should say Zimbabwe, Treasury, same thing, is owed three and a half billion US dollars by corporates and municipalities, we have collected VAT, pay as you end, but not transmitted. So what ended up happening is that Treasury was now forced to use the Reserve Bank of a draft window to, to pay its bills, but it was just owed money. So we have a, a serious compliance challenge, very serious. So our view was, you know what, maybe let's come up with something that will force compliance. So, so that, that, that was our best idea. I'm happy to listen uh, to uh, any other ideas uh, going forward in future. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm all ears. As to how we want to use it, you know what? My, my view is like this, and, and this, uh, um, you advise me otherwise. I don't think Zimbabwe is really hate the 2% state. I think, I think, no, let me, let me finish. The issue is how do we use your money? That is the issue. I don't think everyone has said that 2% is a lot of tax. They said, how are we using our money? So, that's for us at government, the government to be credible on that. We should show the uh, results of how we're using the money. And, and I think that the issue of devolution is not a small matter. We have allocated $310 million for that purpose. We have used a formula uh, uh, that works as, as follows. So, so, so first of all, 25% uh, uh, of those funds are applied at, at, at the level of both provinces for both running expenses but the bulk of it is capital expense. That's about 75 million or so. Then the remainder, uh, three quarters, is at district level. Every constituency is covered by name, and I know all of them. And I know how much we've allocated for each, absolutely. And we, we've used the formula. The formula is we look at poverty levels, so it's very people-oriented. We have a whole poverty map for Zimbabwe, we have it. 
Then if we look at the infrastructure deficit, looking at a, a very simple variable is the, the, the number of kilometers of unpa unpaved dirty roads. And then the third is popula population size. So population, infrastructure deficit, poverty. We do the allocation. Uh, as an example, for instance, the, because I know this figure for sure, for Kanyemba, for instance, where I was last week, we allocated 2 million out of the 210. But there's still money at the provincial level, at the level of Mashallah and Central. So every corner of Zimbabwe is covered by this. And in my view, that's a very useful uh, use of, of the, these, these monies. Secondly, is the social sector. Of course, you can single out teachers, or nurses, whatever, but that, that's your social sector, supporting service delivery, making sure there are enough resources in the health sector, in the education sector. That's what this is about. 3,000 teacher or one teacher, that's what the issue is about, enhancing service uh, delivery. Um, I look at it, how much are we going to raise? Maybe I shouldn't say the figure. The minister has too much money, want more salaries. I, I shouldn't speak. I, I know the figure. So, 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 but I would say that the focus is devolution, social services are the key areas. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, our, our strategy for showing how we, we were using, uh, utilizing resources uh, also shows in the way we're making savings. I've said to the, all my ministers, my colleagues, and the members of parliament so far, uh, we, we shouldn't have these fancy cars. Uh, we have not authorized the purchase of a single car for a, a, a minister in Zimbabwe. None. I say to them, you know, I, I, I need the money to buy ambulances. I need the money to, I need ambulances, and that's what I'm going to buy with the savings from the cars from the ministers. That's what I'm going to do. Right? So, so, so we're very serious uh, about, uh, about this austerity, about walking the talk, about meeting the people of Zimbabwe halfway, about using their 2% taxes properly. It's the 2% tax, so it's not about you know, uh, pay unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It's about us giving back to the people what they contributed in the first place and covering areas where we think that we can create the right, you know, type of public goods uh, for everyone to, to be able to benefit from. All right. I think just to add on to that, the question I wanted to ask, but I want to ask it now, is uh, the pain that people feel um, when it comes to the 2% tax. It has to do with the fact that it's, it's heavily burdened on the former, formerly employed. Um, already the formerly employed are getting hit left, right and centre from the paycheck end. I mean, I, every time I look at my paycheck, I'm always like, you know, <laughs> I can't believe it. Then you have the 2%. So I think the pain of the 2% is not necessarily what it's used for. It's the fact that people feel that it's, better, it's burdening the people who are already working to drive the economy. And they feel that perhaps if the 2% can be plucked from elsewhere, um, I think this is what we need from you guys as well. If you have any sort of ideas or solutions to this, we will have the Q&A section and then afterwards we'll definitely find ways of communic communicating back to the minister. So I think on that note, that is where the pain of the 2% is coming from. Well, we'll not think. Thank you, Milton. Okay, we move on to probably arguably the most critical question of the day. And that's Mabasa. Jobs, yes. I'm sure you're aware, Minister, 90% of Zimbabwean youth are currently unemployed. The economy is very informal, and we don't know, do you have a strategy as to how you intend to absorb these youth so that they can be productive and contribute to the Vision 2030? Because the Vision 2030 will need alignment, it will need buy-in, and it will need all hands on deck, so to say. So what is your plan around how youth can really engage and be employed and have jobs the same way you had a job when you were in your 20s? I must admit I was fortunate to have had a job in my, in my, when I was 21. <laughs> so, 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 so you know what, I'm actually very passionate about job creation. You know, the, the, in my previous life, I created a whole center for entrepreneurship in South Africa. And I still mentor a lot of youth around the world. I'm very passionate about this. So, so it's, it's sitting within the remit of the Minister of Finance, I think that a smarter use of our tax policy is one way to contribute to job creation. What I wanted to elevate within the budget, but I think...
This is a, a, a so maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Correct me. I, I didn't do some research. But anyway, you, there must be some benchmark where you say, look, for every job, not an additional job that you create, we will give you a rebate which is equal to a, a percentage of the average salary for that job category. I'm very keen to really explore that policy and, and see if this logical conclusion as a way to stimulate your job creation. But also, we did a lot in the budget in terms of rebates uh, for, for, for imports, for in terms of import substitution in the furniture sector, in the SME sector, and all of that is contributing to job creation. But as going forward, I want to be very, very specific about a tax rebate system for additional jobs, especially for the youth. So that's one idea on, on job creation. But, but the other one is really is entrepreneurship, not just job, it's entrepreneurship, where you create entrepreneurs out of, out of, out of, out of, out of the youth. It starts with the acquisition of skills for entrepreneurship in the first place, I think, so that we, we create a whole kind, kind of, of eco ecosystem. I'm aware of the good work that Emprotec does in terms of uh, uh, giving skills, uh, uh, training people in terms of entrepreneurship. That's that, that kind of thing to a point where uh, youth or potential entrepreneurs are able to develop credible uh, business plans. And once they've done that, they need to be incubated. So, so we need to invest more in incubators, and need to be incubated where they can uh, plug in, plug in place, so to, so to say. And also we need our older business people to be mentors. A whole mentorship program uh, uh, around uh, these young entrepreneurs is also uh, important. A fourth pillar is angel investing. We're not very strong on angel investment in Zimbabwe, I, I know that. It is an African weakness, by the way. Uh, we're not very strong on angel investing. Uh, uh, those who don't know what that is, basically it's about those who have made it and, and have, uh, are very comfortable in terms of personal wealth, they invest their personal money in new entrepreneurship adventures to support the youth uh, and so forth. So we need to develop a culture of angel investing. A fifth pillar is venture capital. I'm very passionate about uh, launching venture capital funds in Zimbabwe. The last time I interacted with some of you in our youth engagement, I challenged you to come back to, to me with proposals for several uh, venture capital funds. Because we know the, the limitations of uh, uh, the power bank, uh, of the youth bank, they, they always require collateral, and the interest rates can be unaffordable. But that's the nature of a bank. That's the nature of debt capital. What you really need is equity investments, pension capital in the form of venture funding. And I'm sure the pension funds could be cajoled into investing in several venture funds. And I stand ready to really, really uh, uh, support that. In fact, I'm not even tempted. I was actually challenging my staff the other day that, look, should we find a portion of this 2% tax to capitalize a national venture fund? Because I'm frustrated that I'm not getting the response from yourselves out there as, as entrepreneurs. So I'm trying to give a story here about how we can create an ecosystem for supporting youthful entrepreneurs as, a, as, a, as a, an accompaniment to job creation in the first place. You need both entrepreneurship support as well as job creation to corporates uh, uh, for that, for creating those, all those jobs. I've had arguments about, uh, that I used to push this a lot, about um, uh, maybe even reforming the, the curriculum. The uh, Minister of Higher Education has done a survey to show that while Zimbabwe's level of literacy is very high, but the, the skills level is actually quite low. So, 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 so those artisanal vocational skills are missing in a lot of our A-level uh, students. Uh, uh, it, it, may, it may be worthwhile, you know, think about it at it, 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 um, uh, the fifth form to introduce some subject that deals with some kind of artisanal skill, you know? It, it, it's an idea, it's an idea. Um, uh, and let's, let's make sure that we, we, we start grafting vocational education skills into a standard curriculum as part of creating a, a, a people who are more job ready, who have skills beyond uh, merely academic skills. So it's a long answer to, a, I guess, a very simple question, but just shows you that it is not a simple question. And just a quick follow-up question on employment. Um, a lot of our companies locally are, are really retreating into what I feel is a survival mode. 
you know, a lot of people are being retrenched, they can't cope with the current level of employees they currently have. Do you feel they can be sufficiently motivated by that re rebate agenda? And we're also noticing a trend where newly graduated uh, youth who want to get employment are kind of being sidelined because they, they can't get internships and, and you're not seeing in businesses and employers keen on taking on the youth and mentoring them like you mentioned. How are we going to make a paradigm shift or okay, care in the minds of businesses? And while they're focusing on survival, how can they start to embrace and take on more employees, especially in the youth sector? Two points on that. On internships, the tax rebate scheme by them would include internships. I want to be clear on that. I've tried to really think through this, so, so you shouldn't be surprised if you hear me next year, next budget, articulating it in detail. I think there's something in it. But coming to, to the plight of corporates, uh, I, I really the issue at the moment is the shortage of foreign currency uh, for, for, for our corporates. And then that goes with the currency reform. So for me, I, I, from where I sit, I think really the silver bullet is about currency reform. If we get that right, so that the corporates can access foreign currency whenever they need to, a lot will change. The, 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 the currency reform agenda is also impeding foreign investment, by the way. We know this, we're fully aware. If investors cannot take their money out, they're not going to come in investments. They can't take their money out because we don't have the forex for them to do that, that conversion. Um, um, so the issue really is, is currency reform. If we get that right, and I believe we will, a lot of these issues will, will go away. I know that it's not the, the first order of business is not a tax rebate uh, for them. It's actually the availability of foreign currencies. It's as simple as that. So I'm acutely aware and we'll, we'll deal with this forex and form issue uh, sooner than you think. Okay, I'd like to build on, build on, on that. Um, I'll quote something that, was, that you said um, within a, a certain paper. It said, open quote, the private sector should wait for you to give policy. We are making good pro progress in fiscal consolidation. Um, once we are ready, we will institute requisite currency reforms and you were touching on currency reforms. The question now comes from the, from the corporations, um, especially those that are heavily dependent on raw materials, that have to import raw materials, because waiting for forex allocation is, make, is putting a lot of strain on a lot of businesses that don't have a link that, that draws raw materials from local companies. So the question then becomes, how far are we within the fiscal consolidation uh, process? Like, are we halfway there? Are we, do we still need how, how much more time before we start talking? Currency reform. I, I like to believe we are cross, but as you can imagine, currency reform uh, sometimes has to happen by stealth. Because it's always very sensitive. Again, that balance between preservation of value, which may involve speculation and distortion, that, that's a fine balance that we have to walk. So, so it's what it is to, to, to pronounce a, a long road map uh, with milestones. You don't do that. You, you just invite in speculation and attacks and everything and positioning. So I, I, I think we are close, I, I, I think I can safely nod, we're, we're, we're making good progress. I said that if you've been reading between the lines, currency reform started on the 1st of October. That separation, if you're listening, if you're watching, listening carefully, and I know you are, the Marvins are much too smart, they, they, they are, it has started, and what was missing at that point was the fiscal discipline that we've now put in place through the budget, the strength for prosperity. Now I'm confident that with it, that solid fiscal framework, we can successfully institute a successful uh, 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 currency reforms. And my message to the corporate sector was, was because, I, frankly, I do not believe that uh, adopting the US dollar is currency reform. That's capitulation. It's actually the opposite of currency reform. Currency reform means something else. It means that creating something that we're all proud of, something that we can defend, that is credible something that will not erode our co competitiveness. The US dollar will erode competitiveness, absolutely. We know that. And going forward, it will just get stronger as a currency. And that's not good for a weak economy like ours. Honorable Minister, you say that we are close. And that's a rather a vague response. It is vague. I say this because there's, there's a lot of young people who are, are going to be casualties along the way on this journey. Uh, to currency reform, you have young parents in this room who swiped $250 bond for a pair of Tuffy's shoes with the schools opened. 
and all of the speculation and price hikes is a result of the lack of currency reforms. So are you in a position to give a more maybe concrete response in terms of months, weeks, days, years to allow young people to plan for their lives? It's, it's months. Months, okay. So it's months. Less than 12 months, right? Less than 12 months. So we just want to touch on representation. Um, so in the youth sector, we have different pockets um, that exist within us. A, a very cr critical uh, pocket that we have is those of people living with disabilities and marginalized groups. Um, they don't feel that there has been much mention about how they can be involved in the economic process. Um, what is your view or what is the plan in terms of including that group of youth? In the, in the budget, I tried that in terms of uh, not just an inclusion in economic opportunity, to be honest, but more in recognizing that they, they need our support. Uh, if you read that section of the budget where I went to town about the various import um, uh, exemptions for, for items used by those living with disability, we really went to town, and if they came to visit me afterwards, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Mabaudi, uh, if you know him, maybe you don't, uh, at least I know him, I, I met him, and uh, he said, Minister, we thank you very much uh, this is the first time that any Minister of Finance has spent so much time targeting issues that the disability, those living with this disability are facing. I agree with you that we need to do more in being explicit, in, in, in including them in economic opportunity, uh, absolutely. And, and in fact, after my meeting with them, I said, look, uh, I need your CVs because I, we have one or two board slots uh, at board level where we should be including uh, people with disability to also participate at board level. Uh, but I agree with you that in terms of jobs, in terms of entrepreneurship, we need to do more. Maybe what we should do is, once we launch this venture fund that I'm very fixated on, we should just say, you know what, maybe 10% of the assets uh, in this fund should be just allocated uh, to those entrepreneurs uh, who are living with disability, or for rewarding those companies that are employing more of those with disability, something like that. But we have to do something, and, and I agree with you. And that's the best I can think of at the moment. Thank you very much for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have a, a document here with 41 questions that we are not going to ask. This next moment, this next segment that we're getting into is we want questions from you. We want your questions, we want your solutions, we want your thoughts. But ideally, you have to keep it very short and sweet, literally a 20-second pitch. We need to have as many of us be able to ask questions and engage with uh, the minister, and that is very integral. Please remember, no critiquing. All we need is questions to the policy, questions to what we've discussed. We need our dialogue to be very constructive and enable us to then move forward with Maybe, maybe we we'll take three at a time so we can then Three at a time, all right, definitely. Yeah. So what, we'll start off first, this is the only chosen one, and then free flow from there. We will start off with a question from B, a B2C representative. Are they ready? Sorry. Um, from the Citizens Lab. Sorry, my, my, my wrong day. From the Citizens Lab, please uh, let's give them the mic and you, you have the floor. Remember, short and sweet, and then we can have more involvement from people. Thank you. What is the Ministry of Finance proposing to deliver for the youth in 2019, in these four months, um, in terms of the transition establishment uh, program? And how can we uh, measure uh, the results in terms of our uh, mutual feedback? How did you get that? Okay. Next question. Um, good day. So we just realized that tobacco was one of the highest foreign currency earners this year. Why aren't we tapping into cannabis as well? Because exports to Canada right now, we can be able to do that. So we've got 99 year leases, we've got arable land, we've got people who are interested in agriculture. Minister, come to explore this option. I, I think with the stresses about what people are afraid, uh, we might get a little too high. Uh, 
So, well, I think the government is playing it safe. <laughs> but very important question, thank you. Can we have the third question? Thank you very much, Minister. Um, my question comes in response to your availability. You were talking that you were saying, uh, I'm waiting for the proposals to come, but uh, it's very, very difficult to access your office, uh, by the way, Honourable Minister. And we have come with uh, some proposals, but just to I'm seated with a fellow here. You he also tried to come, I think, about several times. Yes, myself also. And it's very, very difficult for us to, to access you. Okay. Let me just take a fourth question as well. Yes. All right. Because okay. that one is a statement which is also yes. true, by the way. So. <laughs> okay, can you have a fourth question? Afternoon, yes, Minister. Um, we understand the 2% tax. It's something we have to live with. But can you not use the 2% tax for something more holistic and meaningful like a health fund? That allows a us health to, fund? Yes. Mm -hmm. That allows us to have free access to health or some measure of decent health. Because... It's very important. Health is the livelihood for everyone. Okay, so we'll stop there and the minister will address and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah. Let's take this one. The, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, the youth programs or youth uh, uh, issues within the budget or, or TSP. Yeah, so I mean, we pronounce on this. As I say, really, the, the, when we want to measure the issue around the, uh, uh, job creation for the youth, through the, the, the tax the deliberate system. We've said use it or lose it. Uh, so one of the things that we're measuring is whether these companies, as they use the rebate system, they, are they creating jobs or not? Are they creating jobs for you? So that's one area that, 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 that we target in this budget uh, as we implement the TSP. But, but in my earlier contribution, I went further to say I, I want an even more robust program in 20. 20 budget where we want to, to expand the rebate system and be clear that we will, we will give a rebate of an X dollars for so many new jobs created. So I'll be very specific about that and see how that works. So that's where we are headed. But this year we have a kind of blind instrument because we have a, a broader set of rebates that are very well targeted, but we still measure the, the amount of little jobs created. Uh, we will we'll be able to report on this. On the tobacco levy, so on the cannabis issue, I agree with you. It's a great opportunity. We should move faster. Um, yes. The, the answer is yes. So, yeah. So I, I will convey this to my counterparts in agriculture as well and health uh, to make sure that we can issue those licenses for entrepreneurs to, to invite other partners and get on with it. And I'm aware that uh, Canadians have uh, been in town working with local partners to, to, to try to acquire licenses and get into this kind of business. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's big business. It's big business. My, my availability, I, I work really hard. Uh, uh, my time is short. Those are the facts. It's true that I'm not always available for, for meetings at, uh, at short notice, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. In fact, you know what? When I started, I started working in Italy in September, October, and that's the beginning of the budget learning uh, period. So you just go deep into that. The whole of November, December, it was budget, budget, budget. And I'm still in budget mode, by the way. Uh, I spent 12 hours the last uh, day of, of the budget approval in Parliament from 12 p.m. to, to, to what, uh, it was 2 p.m., I'm sorry, to, to 2 a.m. That's when we passed the budget. That's the nature of the beast. And I had to spend a similar amount of time at the end of the month of the Senate. So it, it has been that time of the year when I'm deeply involved in the budget, and then you still have to fit in everything else. Uh, and so my availability is curtailed. But I, I suspect, you know, once uh, we've gone through Senate uh, in February, then I'll be more available. Let, let's give it a, a, a go, then. I'm, I'm always happy to listen to ideas and support them. I'm very serious about this idea of venture fund. Other ways for using the 2% tax, such as the health fund, we already have a health fund. We also have the HIV uh, uh, fund as well. So, but this is an idea. So I want to receive more ideas to see how we can better use this uh, uh, wonderful tax, 2% tax in, in the future, uh, to make sure that we can feel it uh, as, as citizens will contribute to it in the first place. So more ideas uh, will tweak as we go forward as to how, how, how we apply it.
Just a quick commentary there while you're on the budget, Minister, and I don't want to take any time from the floor. Um, we, we're hearing that there was an incremental um, allocation allotted to Parliament, 80% uh, increase, I believe, of the budget. We heard talks of gym memberships and three-course meals and desserts. So I think maybe the youth would like some clarification. Maybe how are you deciding on who gets an increase, increased budget? You know, the Ministry of Youth doesn't have a very robust budget, and yet you find that there was an increase on this end. So maybe how are you, how are you um, deciding on which groups receive an increment on the budget, given that there's a lot of pressure on the budget? No, I agree. I, they, they, you know what, let me start off this way. When, when the initial votes were submitted, uh, in terms of you know, the various ministries uh, uh, saying, uh, mentioning, uh, specifically indicating rather what they'd like to, to receive in 2019, when we add all of that up, it came to about 18 billion US dollars. So the submissions were as large as the whole uh, GDP of the, of the country. 100% GDP budget. Uh, just imagine that. Eh? <laughs> so, so that's the starting point. So the demands are, are there. I agree with you and to allocate is never easy. Coming to Parliament specifically, I had initially allocated 101 uh, a million dollars, which was already a 25% increase from the previous year. And, and obviously the feeling was that that was uh, law. Uh, I must admit, I am sympathetic to always empowering the, the, the legislature, because that's what, uh, 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 if they do their job well, they act on behalf of the people to monitor the executive. So that's always a good thing to empower uh, to capacitate them so they can monitor us so we do the right thing and deliver uh, for the people of, of Zimbabwe. But, uh, but really, uh, uh, initially, this is in the media so I can talk about it, they had requested a budget of 163 million uh, and then through some negotiation we ended up at 145 million. They did give some reasonable arguments and of course I did disagree with them and they still disagree on the type of cars that they, 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 they want to be seen driving around. It's not the time to be seen driving flashy cars like if you are in the legislature or you're in cabinet or in government. That's the wrong time. We have to meet the people of the halfway. And I agree with you that other departments need the resources even more. So, so, so I agree with you, but in the end, we agreed on 145 million. It's a done deal. Uh, but then we could still negotiate in terms of implementation so we can divert resources strategically as we implement uh, the budget uh, you know, uh, right, right through the year. But yes, it, it's an issue, uh, and, and it's quite clear that they were, they were very pushy about it. Uh, they wanted these resources, they tried to give uh, good reasons. But, but other departments also have good reasons, you know? Uh, those, those are the facts. We just don't have, don't have enough money uh, going around, frankly, and we have to balance things all the time. So, okay, I think the youth will know so, to be pushy. I think we'll go back to the floor and make sure there are questions. Four more questions. Yeah. Whilst we get the next question, I think a very good car we could um, suggest to to those who are looking for new cars is a, what, what is it called? The Wish. What is it? The, it's a very good car, trust me. It's so fuel efficient, it's long, the whole family. One point. Okay, so who's next? Please, can we sort out his mic? Honorable Minister, I've got a question for Shwarin's industry. Um, and I can say they are keen on the infrastructure funds, but they've not been engaged to that extent. And if there is any concern or worry that they might have, it is against perhaps government functionaries pillaging against such funds that might be set up. But they are keen, given that the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange and the various other investment instruments are no longer creating new assets that can benefit the long-term funds. So if you are looking for patient capital, it is available. But let's engage regarding the infrastructure funds, the, the beverage, new roads, and various other strategic investments in the country. I'm sure the insurance sector can be able to be tapped in. Thank you. Very good point. Remember, guys, let's keep it short and sweet. Can the next? Um, hello, Minister. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I just founded a company called Fresh in a Box. And, fresh um, in the Box. Fresh in a Box. I sell vegetables. 
just that I, I'm the media pub sick. But <laughs> um, I use mobile money to transact for my clients, but to get projects from farmers, I need to give them cash. And that gap or space that you have said that we are going to maintain at one is to one is addressed by EcoCash agents, for instance, who charge me an 18% premium for me to be able to get money. I know that they're EcoCash. You charge you what premium? 18%. 18. Yes. So I know that there are people from EcoCash here. I think I got a side of Natalie here. I think we need to have a conversation about when we have a cash crisis, how is it that their EcoCash cash out transactions from all of their agents reflect at least $10,000 worth of cash sent out, but somehow there's no cash in this market? It's, it's, we can't explain that. So we need for you to regulate some of these big players so that we can have a handle on the black market because we are suffering. I'm willing to pay 2% when that 18% is actually handled. Thank you. We will take a third question and then the minister will take it from there. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, my name is Malvin. I, I agree with what you say and I believe that you actually have a vision of what it takes to restore Zimbabwe. But just to give you a check, there are so many young people that want loans here. But that 5,000, because that 5,000, I'm not But when you see very few actually apply for loans, that means it's a disconnect. And just like him, we also came to your office just to give you input in the budget. You know, as young entrepreneurs, I think look at these few factors. You're asking for a venture capital fund. I've got a blueprint for them in my mailbox right now. You're you looking for a blueprint for a venture capital fund in the business incubator. Mm -hmm. I have it right now. If you need it, I can present it in five minutes. <laughs> so, there's no shortage of ideas, but I think what you need is an interface between the government and the young, smartest minds. Because obviously, by the vote, you see they don't like the government. But, marriage. <laughs> I mean, so, so the this big member, short and sweet. Okay, I thought they were short. I'm joking. <laughs> So what you need is just the interface, and I actually have a blueprint for that. If you give me 15 minutes of your time, I'll deliver it. I just need 15 minutes of your time. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Right, Minister, the floor is yours. Oh, let, 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 let me have a I'm very passionate about the infrastructure fund, and, and to me that's the way to go, because it dovetails with the whole idea of PPPs, that, that if you have got uh, an SPV uh, that is going to, to implement some, some road project, uh, better still if it can raise funds domestically uh, through an infrastructure fund which is listed on the public stock exchange, we deepen that uh, fixed income market. To me, that is the way to go. I'm very passionate about, about this. Uh, we are right that we need some momentum on this. Uh, sometimes I feel that my job is to plant a seed and hopefully someone picks it up. But then if they don't, uh, then I feel kind of frustrated. I wish I was the one doing it, but I can't do it as minister. I tell you, if I was a minister, I would be doing it. Trust me. I'll be out there raising funds, venture fund, uh, uh, you know, uh, raising uh, capital. Uh, I think uh, you need to hire some of the people in here. I think yeah. you have very brilliant minds who yeah, exactly. can do that on your behalf. Yeah. And again, I'm not allowed to hire anyone because it will be called abuse of power or something like that. <laughs> So, so, but I agree with you that, that, that that's the source of passion culture that I, I wish I was the one doing it, but I can't do it as minister. I tell you, if I wasn't minister, I'll be doing it. Trust me. I'll be out there raising funds, venture fund, uh, uh, you know, uh, raising uh, capital. Uh, I think uh, you need uh, to hire some fund. of the people in here. I think yeah. you've got very brilliant minds who, yeah, can, exactly. who can do that on your behalf. And again, I'm not allowed to hire anyone because it would be called abuse of power or something. Like that. I, I don't know. It's urgent. It's very, very important. And I agree with my friend there from the insurance sector. Uh, that we should move uh, 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 with speed. Sometimes we, we spend a lot of time going abroad to seek a foreign direct investment for some of the infrastructure. It's not necessary. If domestic capital is adequate for, for, for financing infrastructure. I know it. I don't want to be specific uh, about projects, but a specific project that you know, you know what? 80% of the capital is, is local and short in sector uh, that we should move uh, 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 with, with speed. Sometimes we, we spend a lot of time going abroad to seek a foreign direct investment for some of the infrastructure. It's not necessary. If domestic capital is adequate for, for, for financing infrastructure. I know it. I don't want to be specific uh, about projects, but a specific project that you know, you know what? 80% of the capital is, is local currency. That's all you need. You don't need any hard US dollars. Absolutely not. No need for FDI. Uh, and that's what we, we must uh, recognize. 
the, the I think that that was a question uh, fresh in the box uh, for me and uh, and Jabangwe, uh, but I also don't want to put her on the spot. Uh, you know, let me just say this: I think one silver bullet here, I go back again, is currency reform. If we institute currency reform, some of these because this is a distortion. Give you 15 minutes, uh, uh, five thousand dollar loans and so forth. Uh, again, the requirement is collateral. You know, there's one collateral, the one this. Uh, in the banking sector, we need to move away from that and, 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 and use venture funds, in my view, and, and remove that, that need for collateral. You, 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 you must always like the finance minister. Always. You must never hate the finance minister. <laughs> you, can, uh, you mentioned that, and, and, and you know, we must never do that, because, because then we, we can then work together so that we can solve some of the issues that we need to solve together as bubbles. And suddenly, in the finance space, uh, I believe we we can do that. As I said, I'm really tempted now to say, you know, part of this 2%, maybe rather than doing this and that, let's have of a portion to a, a seed capital for a venture fund. I'm already thinking like that now. But because I'm, I'm not seeing the response fast enough, but, but I'm, I'm, at least there are two responses from can then work together so that we can solve some of the issues that we need to solve together as Zimbabweans. And suddenly in the finance space, I, I believe we, we, we can do that. As I said, I'm really tempted now to say, you know, Part of this two percent, maybe rather than doing this and that, let's have of a portion to a, a seed capital for a venture fund. I'm already thinking like that now, that because I'm, I'm not seeing the response fast enough. But but I'm, I'm, at least there are two responses from the crowd, so we have something to work with uh, uh, from today onwards. Thank you. Well, can I just encourage our team maybe to get a few questions on our social media platform that's live streaming while we get questions from the floor? Okay. Can we have the next three questions? Thank you so much, fine. Thank you so much, Minister. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just please, just please hold on. No, no, I can see her. Yeah. Okay. Mine is not a question per se, but it's an emphasis. Yes. Because I. Please, can we sort out the mic first? We need to be. We need to hear the question clearly. Yeah. It is. It keeps going off. Yeah. So. I think for us as people with disabilities, we have been at the charity end for such a long time. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was saying, as people with disabilities, we have been at the receiving end, at the charity model for quite a long time. And it's high time for us to also participate in the economic development of the country. And I think as the minister, maybe you should put in place policies that also ensure that as people with disabilities, we are also fairly employed in the economic sector, maybe by putting policies like each and every company should have a percentage of no employer people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think you really need to do something about that. Okay. That's a very good question. Okay. Let's take the next two questions. Uh, thank you very much, like Honorable you. Minister. Um, my question is related to health care. I know that Zimbabwe is a signatory to the Abuja Declaration, which says that 15% of the, uh, health, of the budget should be to health care. Uh, but our health care system is bleeding. Uh, we just had a strike. Um, I would like to know um, why uh, the budget allocation was less than that when we are a signatory, and if we are going to have it sometime, when will it be? Thank you. Uh, just to add on to what my sister there said, I think uh, the policy, like for example, this dependency syndrome that uh, is attached to people with disabilities. As a young person living with the disability myself, I feel like if you would focus more on educational policies or educational mm -hmm. funds and creating space in this new government, you know, for people with disabilities so that they can shine. And probably we have some of the solutions that you're looking for in this government. Absolutely. That's a very good point. Uh, Minister, do you want to take another one or handle no, this? No, let's take two, two more. Okay, two more questions. Two reinforce each other. They are very important. But they reinforce two more each questions? Other. Uh, yes. Yeah. Remember, uh, guys, short and sweet. Okay. okay. Honorable Minister, I have a question for you because I've been listening to you. And I want to ask you, do you think the actions and what you are saying is building confidence and establishing trust with us as your constituents, if I can say that, because everything you're saying, you are not answering fuel. Healthcare. You're not answering high fees with your policies. 
you are denying that the US dollar and the bond not, are not equal. We don't trust you. Please make us do something to show us that we can trust you and that you're building and establishing confidence as business. Okay, can I have one more? Thank um, you. Honorable Minister, my question is about how is the government planning to raise the forex that will support the introduction of a local currency? I noticed you alluded that dollarization is not it. And so obviously the other option is having our own Zimbabwean dollar. But what are the practical things that the government is doing to actually raise this foreign currency? And sorry, just to add a second question. Why are pensioners being made to pay the 2% tax? Uh, why were they not exempted? And last oh, thing... they are exempted. Um, that's not what I've heard from the pensioners that I know. And last thing, oh. have you considered levying a tax on um, foreign currency accounts in order to start raising the forex reserves require, required to, guys, come on, like we need forex reserves to have our own currency, required to like um, build the reserves. Let's, let's allow her to finish yeah. and then we can take it All from right, there. Thank you. Okay. Um, Minister, let's address those. Do you want no, to? Maybe, maybe another one. Okay, one maybe more. One, so one question, more guys. One question, yes, one, one person. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, I'd like to know, what's your stance on local investment for aggressive exports? Like, I'd like to take a case study of Australia. Um, one of its biggest exports is, like, meat, chicken, of which in the back of, of every yard in Zimbabwe right now we have chicken. Talking about the venture capital that you're talking about, it's not an issue that we don't have uh, the mindset of venture capital, uh, but then um, what we need is a group of people stationed around one place researching around the same things that we need to do. For instance, if you want to export chicken, we say China is one of our biggest friends. China's got the biggest market. China's got like 3 billion people. If you get 10% of China, we're drawing in so much income on uh, foreign direct, it's not foreign direct investment rather, it's like forex. So basically what we're talking about is we need to have a group of people uh, that uh, reassess issues of local investment for aggressive export. What's your, what's your thought on that? Uh, look, do it. Who is stopping you from creating a group of people? Uh, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I've been an entrepreneur before. I'm telling you, no one is stopping for you. Go for it. If you're looking for support from our ministry, from government, just tell us what you need. Just go for it. I, I, I agree with you, actually. I don't even know what to say beyond that. That you need local investors to be export-oriented, and foreign currency, not just because they're just earning a return for the investment, that's what it is, and focusing on, 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 on exports. Now, on the other questions, I think the, the contributions on disability, I agree with you that in terms of emphasis, we need more of that. You will hear more of us on, from us on that in the next budget. And, and, and this idea about a quota on the job market front, I mean, that's a very... A, a, a interesting and important idea is something that, that, that we'll, we'll look into very, very uh, 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 seriously. Uh, and also my friend here at the front is also making a similar point, saying that we'll be so surprised some of the ideas will come from the community that uh, is living with disability, and, and I agree with that, uh, absolutely. On the, the issue of uh, the health care budget, why we're not yet at 15%, again, it's an issue of resource constraints. We would like to do more, uh, but you'll notice that the, in this budget, the healthcare sector received quite a, a, a sizable portion. The largest allocation went to education, uh, the primary and, uh, uh, and, and, higher and, 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 uh, and secondary education. But the healthcare uh, sector wasn't too far behind, so we would like to, to increase that going forward. We will, I can't give you a timetable, uh, but, but we will. But, but let me say this uh, over time, I've become uh, uh, fixated on the whole issue of service delivery. That is how every dollar is used. No, not, not so much the quantum of dollars, but how is every dollar used in terms of the quality of service delivery? Uh, are teachers going AWOL when they should be teaching? Are nurses going AWOL uh, uh, when they should be you know, treating people or something like that? The quality of service delivery is key. Uh, sometimes it's more important than the, the quantum of dollars or budget so, so allocated. So balancing the, the resource envelope and the service delivery is key. Uh, in my previous life, actually, we developed service delivery indicators for health specifically.
and education and we we rank countries zimbabwe is still not ranked so i'm trying to now fine tune it for zimbabwe so that we can start making sure that we follow the quality of service de delivery in zimbabwe uh, as well the issue of, of of building trust again please be, 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 be patient with us we are dealing with the issue of currency reform that fine balance between preservation of value and moving distortions is not easy it is a process it is a journey the journey has already started with fiscal discipline and fiscal reforms uh, bear with us uh, we will deliver on this and hopefully you will, you will trust us uh, more on this i think that be careful about creating suspicion between you a barrier for yourself and then you feel that oh i don't trust what they are say, saying therefore i won't engage government and then you lose out on opportunities we also lose out on your ideas i think guard against that even though you're expressing this frustration uh, uh, please feel free to engage and uh, we'll, we'll listen uh, but we're determined to build uh, uh, trust and close that trust deficit between you uh, or some of you and, and, and ourselves um, on the, the, the issue of raising the forex to introduce the, the, the new currency, we are well on our way already. We are well on our way already. As I said, give us uh, its months, uh, uh, but it's not years. So, so we will raise that uh, foreign currency. We are already well on our way. And, and when we, are, we, are conclu we have concluded, we will let you know, because at that moment, then we have to act. So, and then we will have to let you know. But we are well on our way. Uh, uh, that, that's not a, a point of difficulty. On the issue of uh, exemptions for, for pension payments of the 2%, there are exemptions. It means that someone is not applying the exemptions. Uh, so I would have to check uh, who's not applying uh, those exemptions. But there are exemptions for, for pensioners which are in the, the finance bill uh, that, that, that we announced. Tax on, on Forex, no, 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 we don't want to start taking, taxing uh, Forex FCA accounts. I don't want to do that because we want to encourage you to, <laughs> to deposit uh, your forex. We want the diaspora to send their monies freely without feeling that we would take part of their money and can't explain how we've used it. So, so it may be a good idea, but we think that the signaling may, may militate against our desire to, to increase the inflow of forex into our bank accounts and in, 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 into, into Zimbabwe. Um, yeah, I've already dealt with the last, last uh, question about, you know, mobilizing uh, locals to focus on a specific sector for export purposes just do it uh, absolutely no one is stopping you from doing it do we have a question from our live stream from our facebook platform do we okay okay he will he'll, he'll ask it um he'll be the second question we'll just take a question oh okay he's ready okay so the most burning question on Facebook currently is the issue of fuel. Of fuel, yes. Yes. People want to know uh, when are things going to, um, when, when is the fuel availability going to normalize? And it's not only affecting those who are driving, but also those who commute. Um, one of the comments was saying that from Shitungiza, they were charged $10 to and fro, I think. $10? So. Today? Yes. So $5 to and $5 back. This is too much. Yeah. That, no, it's, that it's is, a point well made. Thank you. That, yeah, that is the first question. And the second question is, when you talked of entrepreneurship, um, one of the facts that we established at the beginning, uh, Tino mentioned that there's about 90% unemployment. And in response, you said you're promoting entrepreneurship. But you're going to find that most of the people running business in Zimbabwe are not as skilled. And there's need to have a solid uh, plan to ensure that everyone has the requisite skills to run the businesses. Okay, okay, okay. So, so skills for entrepreneurship. Yes. Right. Would, okay. Is the government in a position to support or to provide markets instead of giving loans which might fail? Is the government in a position to give markets to some of the youth businesses? Okay. This idea was mooted in the youth policy where the government had... Um, more or less committed to give 25% or a youth quarter to most of the government projects that were being run in Zimbabwe. What's the progress that has been made and what is, what is the status of this at the moment? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Can we have more questions from the floor, please? Very rich questions. 
Right. Um, Minister, um, right now, could you please be able to implement... Apologies, sorry. Can you please stand up? I... Was... Yes. Oh, you're there. Okay. okay. Mama's... Mama's... Um, standing up. Hey. Yes. Minister, um, one of the things is that you're saying that there's austerity, but it, we feel that it's for us, the ordinary people. You guys are being treated outside the country. Why are you not implementing a VIP ward at Parenyatwa? Because you're wasting money going outside. Why is it that Zimbabwe is importing cars when we are supposed to be having Willowville and the Mutaro plant working? Why is it that, why shouldn't we make sure that like all that. public institutions buy locally manufactured cars and even Pali uses local manufactured cars? We don't understand why this is happening. I agree with you. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Samuel Dimaru, co-founder of Chengete Zaiti Postry Company. We automated the clearing and settlement of the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange transactions. Mm -hmm. We hold 10 billion USD of deposits, and in the past five years, we've cleared 4 billion in transaction settlement. My journey started as an entrepreneur when I was 17 years old, and I'm 28. One thing that I can... I've, and the reason why I've told you this background, my question is two-pronged. What's the... Uh, What's the strategy on privatization and how quickly is this going to be implemented? And secondly, government seems to be making the mistake of continuously wanting to get back into business. Instead of government be, being a supporter for business, they are competing with business and they are working against business. I'll tell you today, in the past 10 years... Right? A, a, a give me an example. Sorry? Give me an example. Okay. So, uh, for example... Uh, we have a situation about three years ago where we tried to do a project in the energy sector and we had, we had gotten to the point and met all the requirements and then at the 11th hour we were kicked out and the parastatal put in place and it's failed monumentally over the past three years in delivering that particular service. And in that particular, this is prepaid electricity vending. Everybody knows about that. How many people have tried to buy tokens and failed in the past couple of years? A lot of people um, have had that problem. Um, and when it comes to issues of government being a supporter of private sector, I feel that there is a lot of roadblocks. Right now, if you ask me, and I've met a, talked to a couple of other people, the moment you start thinking of a business idea, as long as government has to get involved in the process, it's a turn-off, if you ask me. Yeah. And I'm now thinking of doing business elsewhere and avoiding government at all, because I don't see the support government gives me as an entrepreneur. Okay, can we have a lady? I haven't seen any lady ask, yep. so I can't yeah. choose. She has to choose. <laughs> good, good, good afternoon, Minister Mtulingwe. My name is Mon Chifamba, and um, I was one of the people who celebrated the new cabinet, and especially because we were sure you were a technocrat, and you're going to keep our country's finances, and you're going to bring some order. Now, when you took over, the black market rate was around 70%. Right now, for me to get 100 US dollars, I have to fork out around 350 from my RTGS. And because my, uh, my salary has not moved to US dollar, it's still RTGS. Now, you say that in, when you're answering one of the questions, you asked us to trust you. You asked us to bear with you. Now you have to understand, for the ordinary Zimbabwean, it's hard. Because things have worsened since you took over. Now, here is my suggestion. You said you wanted a suggestion around the 2% tax. Here is my suggestion. Because it's very hard to trust you, you are going to have to do something for us to trust you. Now, may you please go a step further than I have seen that on Twitter we have a Ministry of Information giving us updates on doctors' strikes and everything. For the Ministry of Finance, is it possible that? Because today, right now here, someone gave you a figure for the 2% collections and you said, no, that's not it. Could you please give us a breakdown of this month, this is what we collected. And this month, 
We use so much towards the 3,000 teachers. We use so much towards retiring youth officers. We use so much on this and this, and even on that capitalization that you were talking about. This is just a suggestion for you, Honorable Minister. Now, my question. Okay, please, okay, Mark, let's keep it. Yes, yes, no? yes. It's short, it's short, it's short. Sir, just recently in the media, on Twitter, it was everywhere. Delta decided that it is going to charge US dollars for soft drinks and for beer. And what we saw was a few days later, they were called by the government and they had negotiations with you and it went back. Now the business is saying, we are charging US dollars because we need to find the US dollars on the black market. While we wait for you to introduce the currency and do what you say that you, know, you are in the process of doing for us to give our currency, what is the game plan, Minister? How are you going to make sure that you are discouraging business from charging US dollars when US dollars is what they need and for them to find it to source raw materials, they will need to get it from the black market. What are the strategies that you are going to use to discourage them to demand US dollars from us because we don't have them? Okay. Thank you. We'll have to catch you there. Thanks. Guys, we're absolutely terrible at the 20 seconds. All right, so let's keep it short. Um, how mo one more question and then... Okay, so the, I think the last question at this point in time because Thanks. unfortunately time is over our heads, guys. So at, we'll take the last question now. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister, for meeting the young, the young people. I think we are sufficiently, I can't say we, they, as the founding curator, I think you can tell on the zeal that they have. Vangwewara ram queues petro. Five hours in the queues. You know, things are, are not good. And it's been difficult for me to keep them infused with regards to these discussions and roundtables there are youth that come from outside, educated outside, very zealous and wanting things to be done. The commitment that I can make to you is that we are sufficiently organized as global shapers, communities, to be able to give you input into what you're doing. If you will give these youngsters the audience. What they've achieved in the past four years is quite remarkable. And I think it, it would disappoint us all if these harness energies were not utilized, we need to take advantage of this youth dividend. So I implore you, as the founder of Global Shapers, let's use these youngsters. They are brimming with enthusiasm, but they are dying because of what the environment is actually offering to them. So please, can we formalize a relationship uh, going forward? I thank you. Thank you. Okay, Minister, the floor is yours. No, I Thank you very much. On the, uh, the question about the, the, the fuel uh, crisis, for example, to dealing with that. So what are we doing today, today, to deal with the queues? So, so, so basically, on uh, Friday, last week, we authorized drawdown of 20 million U.S. dollars to deal with the, 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 the crisis. And uh, those funds were made available uh, yesterday because it takes a few days. I don't want to, there's some detail that I have to skip, uh, by the way, because it's so confidential. But, but it, it, it was in the accounts uh, uh, yesterday. Even when I was in Brussels, I, I was tracking it. Yeah? So, so that should enable us to, to receive about 44 million liters uh, uh, on the back of that, uh, that release. So, so that's just a, a blood transfusion today to deal with the, f the fuel crisis. But a lot more is going on in the fuel sector. We're also quite aware of the arbitrage opportunities that have been created by the, f the price of fuel relative to its price outside Zimbabwe, but also relative to the parallel market. We're quite aware that there's, there's, there's round tripping across either across borders or between parallel market and the fuel market, and there's a whole parallel market for fuel in, in, in the first place, where fuel is being sold, is it for four or five dollars per liter? That's, that's, those are the figures that I keep, I keep, I keep hearing. So, 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 the, so you've got these distortions in the market that are making the situation worse. But I also think that the, don't I think, I know that for sure that one of the issues here is again currency reform. Currency reform, currency reform, currency reform, again is one of the solutions. So, so I believe that if we deal with that, that will go a long way in rationalizing the, the pricing mechanism 
and the, and the behavior of agents within the, the, the fuel sector. Of course, we have a forex shortage. That, 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 that's for a fact. Uh, but perhaps just through currency reforms and, and getting the right pricing for fuel, uh, that will deal a blow into the pricing distortion and the arbitrage opportunity that, that, that has emerged in, the, in that market. On, on, on giving entrepreneurs skills, I agree with you that they need skills uh, to run their businesses, uh, uh, strategy, marketing, financial management, and, and how to go global, how to survive the, the value of death, as they call it, the first thousand days. Uh, all, all of that stuff, they need these skills, I agree with you. They also need this, the, the, to, to access markets. One way to support entrepreneurs, I agree with you, and that was the right policy in my view, is for government to open up procurement opportunities for young entrepreneurs. Uh, procurement programs are, are, are very useful supporting entrepreneurs, as well as SMEs, by the way. This is a, well, it's, it's a tried and tested way for supporting SMEs, for supporting startups, and uh, it's something that, again, in government, we'll take a, a look at and see how, with, uh, how we can accelerate that to make sure that uh, you get those procure procurement opportunities. It's not just government, by the way. It's also large companies. They too must give startups, SMEs, procurement opportunities and support them uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they, then they can survive because with a, a contract from a large company it's far easier to access credit from a bank uh, because the optech uh, uh, roadmap is clear. Uh, so, uh, so I agree with you, this is something that, that again we will, we will uh, 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 push. Um, then uh, somebody made a very passion plea for purchase of cars, I agree with you. Uh, totally, I would like everyone really to buy local. Uh, uh, we have Willowville plant, we have other uh, uh, facilities that we need to support. Uh, we, uh, I don't want to be, us to be allocating resources again to import more and more cars. Uh, when we have locally assembled cars uh, that we should be buying and supporting local jobs. Uh, uh, so I agree with that. Uh, uh, that certainly is priority uh, and I'm pushing for that. Government raising additional resources from privatization is about instilling that private sector led economy in the first place with the right partners for, for that particular state-owned enterprise, including an opportunity for Zimbabweans to buy into the company uh, through a stock exchange uh, listing on, on, on the Zimbabwe stock exchange. And we're saying that you're already uh, an operator within the stock exchange uh, in terms of the clearing of issues and uh, trades, uh, trade secondary and so forth. So clearly this is a, a, a way to go. We are pushing for this. And, and let's see how we proceed in the next two years. We've got 11 companies that we've targeted for, for privatization, banks, POSB, the telecom hearing, uh, uh, Camplex and, and others. Uh, and we will keep pushing to make sure that the privatization uh, uh, happens. Now, but privatization also doesn't mean that government will be selling uh, its stake entirely. We won't be doing that. We will retain a portion but make sure that the, the new shareholders, including management and the public, have a lion's share of, of that, that uh, enterprise. Uh, that, that's the way to go. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about government crowding out the private sector on some of the contracts. It shouldn't be like that. I'm delighted to say the shareholders, including management and the public, have a the lion's share of, of that, that uh, enterprise. Uh, that, that's the way to go. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about government crowding out the private sector on some of the contracts. It shouldn't be like that. I'm delighted to say it three years ago, not three months ago. Um, uh, but that's not, not to say it, might not, it, it will not happen again. But that's quite something that I think we should discourage and in fact uh, encourage that the private sector uh, should do these things. I'm very passionate about PPPs because we're, we're always trying to crowd in the private sector. Government will never have enough skills nor resources to carry out some of these uh, 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 projects. Um, the idea that we should have a, a transparent uh, uh, budget process in terms of the, what we've raised, how we've, we've spent the monies, uh, I like this. In fact, we've started, it's just that maybe we haven't been loud and clear enough. Every month now, we're, we're running what I call the run rate to use cricket language in terms of what we have collected and what we have spent. Uh, uh, again, we can go uh, 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 you know, a, a layer down and explain exactly how much we have collected from income tax, uh, uh, you know, VAT, 2% tax. We have all that data 
and I'm happy to share with you exactly what we collected in November uh, in full. In full, we, it will also show, you know, the target that we had set for Zimra, whether they've met that target or not. Uh, uh, the yearly tag, uh, everything in there, the variance, the whole bells and whistles that goes uh, uh, with uh, tracking f financial performance. We have the data, we'll be doing this. It's, it's a very good, good, good idea in terms of uh, uh, budget uh, uh, implementation. And I hope that you trust us more as we go along. Uh, certainly, uh, don't close the door, uh, as I said, because you feel a trust deficit. Uh, on the contrary, let's, let's get closer so that we can build that trust that is so necessary for us to, to work together as we walk this painful road of, 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 of reform. And uh, you say that things are worse, things feel worse, is, be, is because what was happening, literally, you had a boiling pot with a lid on it. And what we did was to lift the lid. That's what really happened. And, and lo and behold, they it all was. So really, it is the process, it is the process of reform which is necessary which is causing the pain, but let's, 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 let's walk together, let's work together. Uh, it should be painful for, 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 for everyone, uh, in my view, for government, for yourselves, but we'll reach the promised land. I'm, I'm very certain of that. We, uh, it's not normal for Zimbabwe not to have its own currency. It is so abnormal for Zimbabwe to have a budget deficit of 11% of GDP, and that's what we're trying to correct. It is painful. It is the patient basically having to go through that pain because that's the only way they can be healed is through pain and through a surgical knife in the first place. Then uh, the comment by my dear friend uh, Nigel Chanakira, uh, I, I agree with you. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of passion, a lot of enthusiasm in the youth. We must tap into it. Earlier I said, please send me CVs. I'm looking for youthful members to join our parasitical boards. Uh, uh, at least I would like to have one youthful member uh, uh, pay, pay board. Uh, for instance, I know that the board of Zimra is not yet complete. I know that for sure. I've got a, a, a few board seats uh, that are, are still vacant. I want to do that. And I've got, at least under my, 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 my purview, there are three other corporates where, uh, again, we need to, to put the boards in place. So please, I'm happy to receive your CVs. But also, we did say, His Excellency has been very clear about this, that uh, uh, you like to put in place an advisory board, which will include also members uh, uh, within your fraternity, the youthful fraternity. Uh, we like your energy, we like your enthusiasm. I personally am always inspired by those younger than me. Uh, uh, even if you ask me whom I admire the most, uh, uh, chances are I'll not give you a name of an older person. I'm likely to give you a name of uh, someone who's younger than me because of the energy, the passion. I'm always inspired by what, what you can do uh, and, and your, 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 your enthusiasm. Uh, thank you very much. I thank the Global Shapers for inviting me. I think you said that was the last question, so I'm, I'm also having to thank you. Uh, just in case, Sam, uh, maybe I'm making a mistake, to really thank you uh, that we're, we're walking this road to Davos together. This road is not a luxury. It is a, a, a necessity. We have to plug into the global community. We can't walk alone. We have to work together with the global community. This is one way to do it. It is one way to engage, and I'm delighted that they're giving us all these ideas and asking us hard questions, asking me hard questions, which we need to continue to define the shape of our policy direction going forward. I thank you.